Ivan, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me on. Um, I can already tell this is going to be really fun. It's going to be great. I'm super excited to talk to you today. And, you know, I just for a little context, because my question will make sense when I give you this context. I grew up in Queens and Mm -hmm. um, my dad was, you know, blue collar truck driver, um, went to the bar at three o'clock, smoked cigarettes all day, like that kind of thing. And Mm -hmm. I had a rich friend who uh, had a house in the Hamptons. And so I'd go to the Hamptons and I'd meet these, I'm 55 now, and I'd meet these, you know, chicks at 16 that lived in Manhattan. And it was always this, you know, like this world that like when I got to Manhattan and I was a bridge and tunnel kid, you know, when I, when I crossed that thing and I went into the city, my penis immediately shrunk. You know, I lost it all (laughs) and doing research on you. uh, And and I think it's going to be interesting to hear your perspective on this, but doing research on you, I think with that little preamble, I think a good place to start is you growing up in Manhattan in the seventies, right? You are eighties. Okay. So your, your parents, uh, your dad was a a sculptor and, and a painter and, your mom was a composer and she was a conductor. Let's just start off with that as a as a framework. In what ways do you think that what they did sort of influenced you? Oh, so interesting. Um, I think that part of what they did uh, definitely had an impact because my father was essentially in direct sales, right? So he... For him, his relationships defined his success 100%. He was either able to connect with the right clients who could buy something, or we'd be really stressed out about the bills. Mm -hmm. And um, I think an additional kind of interesting point is that my father grew up in, he was born in 1940 in uh, uh, pre-Israel Palestine. So before Tel Aviv even existed, Grew up one of, I think it was 12 kids in total, super poor. And most of the population that he knew was post-Holocaust. So like people who had come in and survived the war. Mm -hmm. And so there was this always like concern of famine at any point, right? There is probably never enough resources. And there was always kind of like this background of anxiety that like I have two creative parents and there might not be like enough at some point. We have to be really careful. Uh, And as a byproduct of that, the thing we were always really rich with was relationships because the relationships that my father and my mom had would define how well we did. And so there was this consistent focus on who we're connected to, how strong is the relationship. And they would focus actually on doing these gatherings in our home with musicians and creatives and business leaders. This predates anything I ever did by, you know, 30 years. Uh, It's pretty amazing. So with that sort of, this is interesting because I didn't, I didn't get that from the research. I sort of got that you were, and maybe I'm wrong, but I got that you were, you know, a super wealthy sort of like Upper East Side privileged, you know, kid. Was that yeah, the, sort, was that sort of what it was? Kind of, not really. I mean, don't get me wrong. By the time I was a teenager, my father had had a bunch more success and had really made a name for himself. So I, I ended up in private schools. But private schools back in the 80s didn't cost anywhere near as much as what they cost today. And he was always kind of like a he would hustle. So he would figure out ways to like trade his art for part of the tuition and things like that. So it was, I was generally in high school, I went to high school with like, you know, there were really wealthy families there. I went, I think with Paris Hilton and Johnson Johnson kids and things like that. But we were probably the least wealthy family in in school, uh, aside from maybe a handful of scholarship kids. Um, And that's not like, listen, I never went hungry a day in my life, right? I never, uh, there were times when we were worried about making tuition for school, but it was, it, I lived by 
any like almost any global standard a, a privileged lifestyle right yeah uh, that part i get but the interesting part about what you're talking about now this is really interesting because i'm i'm in a similar situation we moved to i'm in a similar situation now as a parent as your mm -hmm. dad was as a parent back then now that i'm living in italy so for example, yeah. uh, my, I have a seven-year-old daughter and she goes to the International School of Florence. And mm. um, you know, I went there the other day um, for a cocktail party and it was a who's who. I'm looking at celebrities, I'm looking at billionaires, I'm looking mm -hmm. at famous designer brands, kids, and I'm the schmuck from Queens that you know barely scraped together what I need to scrape together to, to get the kid into school. So I, so it's interesting because one would look in from the outside and go, oh, look at you, you're in Florence with a fancy private school for your kid. But yet yeah. I just sort of made the, the, the cut, which, which you did too. Um, but what I find interesting is that your parents were in the arts and yet mm -hmm. they were sort of, um, my words, entrepreneurial in a way, to keep you, oh, sure. you know, to keep to keep you where they wanted you, and the reason why I'm I'm spending as much time on this is because, look, like how you grew up informs your life. There's just the way it is. That was, you know, that was your environment. Mm -hmm. Your dad uh, took you as a kid to uh, to the homeland of Israel, and <laughs> uh, he. Uh, he wanted to teach you the value of a buck and the value of hard work. So he had you, he had you, you know, carrying uh, buckets of cement. Um, yeah, sand you, and cement and mix and yeah, for, for, for sure. Yeah, for his family house. Like what, what do you think he was, other than the obvious, you know, what do you think he was trying to teach you looking back on it now as an adult? I think that uh, one was, it was one of the ways that he just found for us to spend quality time together. Like he, the idea of like, especially in the early days, sending me to summer camp or something wasn't like, it wasn't something we really did. And so I would kind of follow him around as he went through his business dealings and uh, assist him. And in New York, assisting him maybe meant stretching canvases and, and like putting the frames on paintings and things like that. And in Israel, when we were fixing our house, uh, it was about like, hey, you're going to do some work and I'll pay you and it's going to be uncomfortable to get used to it. it was, and, and, and you, you know, got this idea. Of you, you, got a whopping, you got a whopping three bucks an hour, right? Something like if I were lucky, yeah. something like it was. Uh, have, you, have you ever heard of this concept of anti-fragility? No. Oh, yeah, 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 uh, yeah, 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 yeah. It, the, the, the book, there's a book, Anti-Fragile, yeah. Yes, it's uh, essentially that like if I drop a glass, it'll break. It's fragile, right? There are certain things that are the exact opposite that when you put pressure on them, actually get stronger. Muscle. Assuming it's like, yeah, exactly. Like building muscle or our social skills, right? We go out, we make some friends, we have some positive feedback. And then like we mess up occasionally, we learn how to behave or how not to behave. And I think, you know, he grew up in, a, when he grew up in Israel, there were like no paved roads and there was, you know, like the idea of a street light <laughs> powered by electricity was like a novel thing. So he, I think really wanted me to, to value how good we had it, have it. And frankly, even though like, you know, it was feast or famine at times, really I had it great by any standard. I mean, especially considering he grew up in the middle of a war and, um, and, at night, he was crossing the street. A cab hit a street lamp. The street lamp fell on his leg, and uh, and it was infected. But there were no doctors to take care of it, and so they sent him home. And after three days of like agony, they eventually brought him back to the hospital. And I, I'm going to describe something that's a little uh, kind of scary and, and difficult to hear potentially. But they had you know middle of the independence war in Israel. They had no anesthetics, no surgeons, everybody was at the front line. Uh, two men held him down and uh, somebody took scissors and removed a portion of his foot. And, yeah. uh, and so he had, you know, he's disabled on one foot and uh, like he had a tough, you know, from the age of eight onward, that was what is, and 
but he was like, no, I got to keep going and really, you know, made something for himself. And I'll be honest, I think I've done some pretty amazing things in my life. I don't think anything compares to a disabled eight-year-old who's dyslexic growing up. They're achieving being able to support an entire family through art and coming to the U.S. as an immigrant, learning a language, uh, several languages, in fact, and, you know, really creating a, a pretty extraordinary life for him and his family. Uh, yeah, you get and, it. You get it now as an adult, but as a kid, I'm sure you were just, you know, he was just dad. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Not only was he dad, this is so good. Uh, my dad, I'm mixed race. So my father's half Yemenite, mm -hmm. uh, half, it looks like Turkish, I think, or maybe North African of some kind, mm -hmm. like uh, Moroccan or something. We're not really sure because nobody kept good records back then. And, uh, and so he doesn't look like everybody else's dad, right? He's like an Afro and he's got like paint covered overalls and all that kind of stuff. So to me, he was like the embarrassing guy who I didn't want my friends to see. And uh, would like, I'd hope he wouldn't pick me up from school because I'd get made fun of. Uh, but like looking back on it, he was the coolest. Like I was going to say, it's, it, to lame. me, it sounds like you're describing Lenny Kravitz. So I mean, like, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> like, but even to like Zoe Kravitz, Lenny was probably an embarrassment. Of course, right? of you course. Know? Of so course. it's uh, my dad's a rock star. My mom's amazing. But when you're eight years old, ten years old, that it's like mom, dad, you know. So you oh, nice. went to uh, you mentioned that you went to a prep school um, and then mm -hmm. you wound up um, sort of going down that New York path. You went to NYU and then you got into yeah. marketing and, and you did that for a while. But marketing, you quickly realized was not your thing. Um, what was it about that? It doesn't have to be marketing, but what was it about that time in your life where you were like, I just don't want to do this. This is not, this is not for me. Like, what was that? Like, take me back to that moment. So there's a couple of things. One was, uh, I was working in, in sales for a while and, uh, you know, it was pretty brutal. I was frankly very good at it, but I didn't find it wildly engaging. There's some people who love to sale, like her totally. Into it. And, uh, eventually I ended up at, uh, Rodale with, uh, which, at the time owned men's health, women's health, all those like fitness magazines. And the, they had an in-house agency and my job was all the digital strategy and, uh, and companies would come to us. And because of the magazines, we had a full-time team of library scientists who would do research for us and find relevant data about anything we asked. It was a, provided to all the magazines. And so clients would come and say, okay, we need help dealing with obesity or something like that with our clients. And so we would email the library sciences team. They would give us all the relevant research and I would pour through the stuff and fall in love with it. And from that research, I'd say, okay, well, based on what we're seeing in terms of human behavior, this is going to be the most effective strategy. And I found that I really had a knack for it, that most companies or agencies would say things like, oh, do you know it'd be really cool? Or, oh, isn't this fun? And I'd say, yeah, it's great if it's fun and cool, whatever. But what I care about is, does it work? Is that how people actually behave? Is that what will get them to you know, eat a healthier diet, to develop an actual habit? And uh, from that, I wanted to begin doing research and I wanted to make new discoveries. And so I ended up getting approached by a neuroscientist to begin to do research. And that's kind of how my path really changed. All right. But then there was a time that that path sort of took a different path. And that, yes. pans, that path then branched off into something that I believe you call the influencers dinner. Um, yes. What, so I was, yeah. So this is before Rodale, actually, this is, um, I was 28 years old. I was uh, totally underemployed. I was pretty heavily in debt from uh, college. Yep. Uh, NYU is pretty expensive. For sure. And my parents gave me a bit of money, but not nearly enough to cover uh, the exorbitant tuition. Uh, and I was that like kind of typical guy that would set his alarm at 6 a.m. and then beat himself up all day for not waking up to exercise. 
Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, and I f- was like looking for a better way to improve my life. And I ended up signing up for a, a program, like a personal development course called Wisdom Unlimited. And it happens over the course of a bunch of weekends. And at one of the weekends, the instructor said that the fundamental element that defines the quality of our lives are the people we surround ourselves with and the conversations that we have with them. I said, if that's true, then maybe instead of setting that alarm, what I need to do is really go out there and make friends with the people I admire, the ones that are exercising every day so that it becomes a habit Mm -hmm. or the ones that are have business success so that I can understand how to get myself out of debt. And, uh, but you know, there's so many like personal development gurus that tell you stuff that turns out to be complete and utter trash. And so I wanted to see what the research actually said about this. And it was an awesome study. These two guys, Christakis and Fowler looked at about 32 years of data and they were curious, does obesity spread from person to person like a cold? Or is it a percentage of the population, like Alzheimer's or something like that? And what they found was absolutely startling. So if you have a obese friend, your chances increase by 45%. Your friends who do not know them have a 20% increased chance. And their friends have a 5% increased chance. And this kind of effect is... Also true for happiness, marriage and divorce rates, smoking habits, voting habits, literally anything we care about passes from person to person. And so it became really clear that I need to do two things. One, connect with extraordinary people. And then the second is connect them to each other. Because if, if I know you, that's great. But if we have 10 friends in common, that's going to pull you closer into my life. And you'll have more of a positive impact on me. I'll have more of a positive impact on you. And you'll have a positive impact on all those other people and vice versa. That essentially is a community, right? When people are, when there's a tight network effect. And so I got really, really curious. What would actually create a community of the most extraordinary people in our culture? And that was the starting point for what eventually became the influencers dinner. Okay. And what year was that? What year did it begin? About 2009 ish, 2008, 2009. All right. So I think planning started 2009 ish by 2010. I was already running dinners. Okay. Um, Are the dinners still happening now? Yes. We just started up again. I've run four uh, since the beginning of the, uh, since the, like people were getting vaccinated and everything. Yeah. Uh, we, and so I've done 231 dinners so far. It, it, over the, la- over dinners. the last decade. Uh, yeah. I Ish. mean, it's a bit more. Like, yeah. Oh, decade. Yeah. A bit more. Okay. Almost so, 12 years, 11, 12. All right. So you, you mentioned a, uh, a seminar that you went to where the guy mentioned the, uh, the quote, but I think mm-hmm. my research showed that you also went to landmark forum. Yeah, yeah. Wisdom Unlimited is like the, so people do the landmark forum and then after the forum, they can do this program called Wisdom, which is where uh, the, that, that quote came from. Okay. Got it. So how has this changed for you over the last 12 years? In other words, take me back, you know, or, or just sort of like, think about that first dinner that you put together and then think about the 230 first dinner that you had what were Uh, yeah i mean you see where i'm going with this right like if you like i'm on i don't know this maybe is the 300th podcast i've done something like that if you heard my first one you'd if i heard my first one i I couldn't even listen to it oh my god okay so the first dinner but so just so the the listeners have some context yeah each dinner has a very particular design Uh, they're all the same uh it's usually about 12 people. They're invited and they're told that they're not allowed to talk about what they do or even give their last name and that they'll be cooking dinner together. When they sit down to eat, we play a game to guess what everybody else does. And then they find out they're with Nobel laureates, Olympians, editors-in-chief, celebrities, 
Grammy Award winners, whatever you can imagine. It's somebody who's influential in their industry. Um, and it's not dependent on like social media following or if you're an heir or an heiress, that kind of stuff doesn't really interest us. Uh, um, what we actually care about is that you use your influence for an impact of some kind. And when I first started, I didn't know anybody really, right? Like I had some pretty interesting friends and uh, that was great, but I didn't know like titans of industry. And so when I ran the first dinner, it was an experiment. I never knew if I was going to do another one after that. And I think we were about 10 people and it was in the summer and the air conditioner broke and we were sweaty and it was a mess and I didn't have the right equipment and my kitchen was super, super small. And it was really wonderful. And it was really wonderful for a few reasons. One is that in hindsight, we remember terrible things as wonderful often. <laughs> and uh, the second is that there's this weird quirk of human behavior called the Ikea effect, which is that when we invest effort into something like assembling our Ikea furniture, we care about it more. And so because I didn't know what I was doing, everybody was pitching in a ton. And these were people I was, you know, relatively friendly with. So it was just a great time and everybody had a ton of fun. But these weren't like the most impressive people you'd ever met. It's like a well-known hairstylist or a real estate developer in New York, but they're not doing like multi-billion dollar deals or something. Like yep. that. And uh, I decided to keep doing it. And dinner after dinner, what would happen is that I would get suggestions of other impressive people. And then I discovered that it's really easy to find just about anybody's email address. You want to get in touch with a Nobel laureate? They usually became a Nobel laureate because they wrote a scientific paper. And if that's the case, then their email address is on it. And so we, I hired uh, some people, some virtual assistants to track down people's contact info. And, you know, we looked for astronauts and all these, you know, anything you could imagine. And nowadays it's this well-oiled machine, right? It, there's all the equipment is at each station. Anything they could ask for or want is there. Um, you know, tables are perfectly set up ahead of time with all the equipment that anybody would need. The guest list is crazy. We just had the chairman of one of the largest companies in the entire world, probably like top 10 um, or 20, and a uh, prime minister and the Pulitzer Prize winner of a very, very famous book. Like, and that's what the guests are like these days. It's just nothing I could have ever imagined. Is this came... one event, is this one dinner a month or are these like hundreds of dinners going oh, on no, across no. the country? So it's every dinner has to have me at it and that's to ensure quality control. Okay. I didn't want like the franchise model where suddenly, you know, people give a, a main stage TED talk, super impressive. And then you go to like one of the TEDx's and there's like, yeah, a quality fall. Some of the TEDx's are absolutely fantastic. It's just very hard to control quality at that scale. Mm -hmm. And we, we wanted to make sure that uh, every dinner you'd want to have be friends with each person who attended. And that's a, a scale issue, right? It's just much harder to, to do it at a massive level. So, um, and we do them every month. I host usually three in New York, one in LA, one in San Francisco, and sometimes one in Seattle. And then I'll do one in Miami during Art Basel and you know, in Park City during uh, Sundance Film Festival. And you know, I'll, I'll sometimes follow the circuit of events because that's where you can often get people who are never available otherwise. This is fascinating. You and I, I'm not sure if you know what I do um, outside of podcasts, but you and I have very, very similar paths here. Um, in, uh, allow me uh, two and a half minutes to tell you what I'm Please. doing, because I think this will be interesting for you. So um, I have, uh, I do two or three events a year for entrepreneurs around the world. The, the Work Hard, Play Hard brand is essentially people that, you know, they love what they do, um, but they do it to a fault. They do it all the time and they don't view it as work, but they're largely sacrificing other areas of their life. So I create these events 
where I bring them in. I've got another one uh, happening in Italy in two weeks. So I'll give you a, a quick highlight. Um, Thursday night, we're going to meet in uh, Milan and we're going to have dinner at Roberto Cavalli's restaurant to kick it off because Milan's all about fashion. So we're going to start there. We're going to spend the day in Milan. I'll take them backstage at La Scala. Uh, we'll go to the Duomo. I've got some uh, some secret restaurants I'm taking them to, et cetera. But then Friday morning, they wake up and I have 10 Ferraris that are waiting from, for them outside their hotel. I've got a team from Modena that's coming down where they make Ferraris. And we're going to uh, drive the Ferraris all together. We're going to stop in Parma, get ham, stop, stop in Parmesan Reggiano area and do a cheese tasting. And then I'm sure you know Massimo Batora. We're going to go into his private villa um, and we're going to do a four hour tasting menu where he's going to teach us how he created the best dishes in the world. And then we're going to stop for balsamic vinegar tasting. And then we're going to head to Como and we're going to do a pizza and bubbles night in Como. And then the next morning I have boats waiting for them. We're going to go down Lake Como, stop at the James Bond Villa, go to Il Bellagio for lunch. And then we're going to go to the oldest seaplane school in the world. And we're going to land a seaplane together, uh, four planes on Lake Como. And at the end of basically what I'm doing is like a four day protracted uh, experience with 20 people to try and create connection um, in a very similar way, which is one of the reasons why I was so fascinated to talk to you, because you're doing mm -hmm. it, um, frankly, it, it, what you're doing in some ways to me is harder because you have compressed time. I have four days oh, yeah. to make it better. You're like, it's go time for you. You got six or seven of these that you do. So the question I have um, around that is, you know, it's, it's draining for me sometimes. People would assume that I'm extroverted. I'm not. I'm much more introverted. Mm -hmm. I'm situationally mm -hmm. extroverted, but I'm a little bit more introverted. And at the end of these events, I'm exhausted, um, more emotionally than physically. Um, yeah. for you, how are you doing six of these a month, five, six, whatever, a month for 10, 12 years? Is it, does it ever get draining for you or is oh, without it? A doubt. Okay. Yeah. So first of all, the early years I was doing it, I do one, then it was six months later and then six months later and then three months later. And then, uh, Frankly, I had this terrible breakup and then to kind of get over it, I started doing them every two weeks so that I'd have like a social occasion and something to occupy yep. my, myself. And then I hired a staff. I started having a little bit more income. You see, this entire project doesn't make any money. Mm. I pay for everything. Nobody gets charged anything. Like I always thought it would be kind of like, why am I going to charge, you know, the prime minister of whatever, 200 bucks for a meal. That's pretty crappy. Like the, the food isn't good. And because when you have 12 people who don't know how to cook, cooking a dinner, you know, it's going to be fine. It's just not going to be fantastic. And so I, um, I ended up, uh, having one of my dinner guests come and she's a famous journalist. And she said, I was expecting a phenomenal meal and decent company. I got the exact opposite. So, you know, the structure of it's very different. In fact, I pride myself on kind of how little we spend and how close and connected people are and the status of the people that come. More to demonstrate that if you're broke, okay, there's stuff that you can do. It's not, human connection doesn't cost a lot of money. What'll drive them to connect doesn't need to cost a lot of money. And in fact, if you look at the most tightly knit communities, they're often the poorest because they need to rely on one another. And so, uh, oh, please, sorry. I, I want to, there's something, there's a thought bubble that's popping in my head here. There's two ends of the spectrum for me. The first end of the spectrum is, I just have this vision of everybody arriving. Nobody knows anybody. Some people are mm -hmm. loud and boisterous. Some people are, don't want to say a word and there are people that are in between. And then, you know, I'm assuming there's wine or something. Eventually, uh, they get more comfortable. The conversation flows a little better. So uh, the question for me then is on both ends of the scale, what do you do at the beginning to break the ice? 
And then mm-hmm. sort of in maybe the middle to the ends, we in America right now have such division, um, Democrats and Republicans and vaccinated and not vaccinated and Black Lives Matter, just all of it. Mm-hmm. How do you navigate the conversations where there's differing opinions in this sort of setting? Uh, I think that you don't. <laughs> Here's, like, I, I don't know why we would need to have that conversation. I mean, does it come uh, up? Are there differences of opinions or is there just things that are just off? You, we don't you, we don't discuss religion and politics. No, we just, I don't tell people aside from their career. I they can talk about anything they want. And we've had, you know, the founding, let's say, members of the Black Lives Matter movement. Yeah. Beyond just the people who who uh, actually are the founders of the organization Black Lives Matter. I mean, there's a whole slew of of uh, civil rights leaders that are involved in in kind of bringing things together the, uh, and people who are on the ground in Ferguson, all that kind of stuff. And uh, it's never been an issue. Amazing. And the, the reason is twofold. Um, one is when you're connecting with people without titles, then uh, you can actually create a different kind of relationship. Mm. One that's based on mutual respect of a human being uh, rather than, oh, you work at this controversial company. Oh, we can't be friends. Well, things are a lot more complex than that in life. There's not, yes, no, you know, yes, somebody's a good person, they're a bad person, whatever it is, right? Um, and so one of my favorite quotes from a dinner was, a, we just found out what a man, uh, a, a male guest did professionally. And the woman next to him said, I couldn't like you more as a person and dislike what you do more. Wow. And it was one of these great moments where I was like, you see, you can actually have people connect and have a mutual respect, even if they fundamentally disagree on big things. Yeah. And she was like some ultra like left wing personality. And he was the uh, editor or founder of the libertarian or something like that, which you know, on the, from a political content standpoint, completely opposing, but they're laughing, they're talking. It didn't matter what he did after that point. They still like chatted and enjoyed each other's company. And hopefully by them now being friends, then there's an opportunity for each of them to see the other one's perspective rather than just seeing an enemy. Yeah. I mean, forgive the pun here, but I feel like you've inoculated yourself from this, uh, this issue because I, as I'm as I'm listening to you and I'm sort of like going through this in my head, if I were at that dinner and I did not tell anybody what it was that I did, and it's the first mm-hmm. guy question. I mean, every dude asks another dude, what do you do? Like, it's just, the, it is the absolute first thing that guys ask each other, right? Because So just, here's an interesting uh, question for you. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure that's necessarily true. Um, I think it's true in very specific worlds. And so uh, I'll give you an example. If you are, let's say, more well-to-do or have a, a career that you've spent years cultivating, yep. then what you do is a representation of identity. Mm. So I'm a doctor, I'm a lawyer, I'm a professional public speaker, podcaster, right? I run these crazy cool trips that are the envy of the world. That's a matter of identity. And we are in such a hustle culture right now that without that, a lot of people don't know who they are. If you are potentially more working class, like you do construction, you do, uh, I don't even know, you work at a plant assembling cars. I mean, awesome work, but just not something that you define your identity by. Then it might be the sports team that you're a part of your political party, your church that really define your identity. And so in those social circles, and I'll be honest, it's, I don't, (laughs) because of what I do, it's the people often don't even want to tell me their career because it's like a kind of joke around the dinners. Um, 
I, so I just don't know because I, I don't get exposure to every walk of life, right? It's, uh, I get exposure to a lot of industries, but I have no idea what the conversations are like in, in, you know, if you're on the Rust Belt, for example. Oh, so your world is a world of people who, number one, they're not allowed to talk about it. And, and number two, perhaps they don't quite self-identify as much with what they do and who they are. No, no. In, in my world, mostly they do. Mostly they do. The yeah. Because the people who I invite to the dinners, their status is so tied into the oh, I'm a research scientist, I'm a NASA astronaut. That, so in that world, it's more natural for people to say, so what do you do? Uh, in other social circles, it might be more natural to say, what teams do you follow? Got it, got right? it. Because that's their marker of identity, not the fact that they work construction three months of the year and then you know, five months of the year, they're on a shipping boat and whatever it is. I once I went to a Tony Robbins event once, and he said something it, um, that I'm gonna I'm gonna um, just kill right now. But it was something like, "There is nothing stronger in the human condition than our need to remain consistent with our identity." Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if that, that sounds. Uh, we will contort a lot of information to justify our self-identity. In fact, uh, there's this funny thing that a researcher by the name of Dan Ariely, I'm not sure if you've hosted no. him at some point. No. Um, he wrote these books like Predictably Irrational, The Upside of Irrational, mm -hmm. like how, how ridiculous human beings are. And he found that uh, each of us has something called a fudge factor, which is there's the truth and there's a lie. And there's this little wedge in between, right? This little bar. And in that bar, you can still feel, call yourself honest, even if you do something that's technically dishonest, right? So it's, but he also found something really funny, which is if you can trigger people being creative beforehand, the fudge factor gets bigger because we get, we come up with better justifications on why we're still good people. Right. So Yes, we are really good at like justifying why I'm allowed to do something, right? Oh, because somebody else did, because it doesn't hurt anybody, because whatever. And the key, I think, is that human beings don't really make much sense. We're, we're like a, we expect that our brain is this one thing that always acts consistent. It's a bunch of systems that are all fighting each other for dominance. And most of what we're actually doing is other than conscious and emotional. And then we justify it with terrible logic. Like my favorite example is I am never more creative than after a long day when I find a candy bar on my counter and I want to justify eating it because there's no way I'm not eating it. Yeah. The only thing that's a variable is like, how creative am I going to be in the justification of why I deserve it? Um, you read Malcolm Gladwell's Blink, right? Yes. All right. So you know that he talks about thin slicing, right? Like you, you know, you see something, and in two seconds, you know, somebody can tell if the, a painting is a is a legit or not. Yeah, I exactly. think they talked about like some statues in a closet. And there you like go. Some right, guy. Right, right. Okay. <laughs> so having under your belt a mm -hmm. zillion freaking people over twelve years. Yes. What's your blink when you're not at one of your things, or maybe even when you are at one of your things? And mm -hmm. you know, let's say, let's say you come over to my place and we have some dinner, and I got a, I got a group of ten people, and you're hanging out. Can you look? And I know, I'm not asking you to do it. I'm just asking you, could you yeah. do it? If you looked at somebody, can you go? He's probably an astronaut. <laughs> do you, oh, do you yeah. have that no, ability? The answer is, <laughs> you don't. Here's what I can tell you. Consistently. Consistently. Surprise. Human beings are awful at these things. Like if I looked at you, I, you know, you're muscular, you're fit, like, right. What would it, I, what would I like assume? Oh, he's like a former athlete that, you never know, played whatever, sport. Right? I never played sports. Yeah. 
but but that's the point is that <laughs> you just can't predict human behavior there's i talk about this in my book how uh uh there's uh the guy who created criminal minds yeah the TV when he show? was researching that the, i'm sorry the tv show yeah yeah uh, when he was doing the research, he essentially found that no serial killer has ever been caught using behavioral science. Like they, they are caught because they like, you know, they have a parking fine. And yeah, so they ran a red jacket. light. Yeah. Now they, they've been able to do a good job, like reducing the number of potential candidates. So like, we know that women tend not to be serial killers and it's a lot of white dudes and like, they've done a, you know, really solid job kind of like, narrowing the field but it's still you know and that's down from 360 million to like okay here 50,000 100,000 200,000 people it could be and that's really a pretty amazing thing to narrow things down that much but it's just not like it, we're just not effective at these things and there's this fantastic study that was done where they gave uh solved crimes uh to a bunch of detectives, police officers, and chemistry students. Okay. And they just gave them the facts of the cases and they had to extrapolate who the person was that did it. And the chemistry students did outdid the police officers and the detectives. And it's just because they were better at basic logical thinking as scientists. Uh, and that doesn't mean that police are incompetent or something. Like It means that this is a really, really difficult job and sometimes more exposure to things actually makes us less capable of, of doing it. A few years back, there was a police officer, I believe, that said, like, being a police officer has made him racist. Mm. And that's because there's so ende much endemic racism in the system that then his immediate response became, oh, it's probably a person of color who committed. And that's not a great starting point for actually solving a crime. You want to solve a crime by looking at the data and seeing where the facts lead, not having a pre-existing notion and shoving everything. Yeah, absolutely. If you it. threw me in jail, I'd probably come out as a criminal. Like, I, I get it. Your environment oh, dictates for sure. it. Um, okay, so uh, as we sort of move towards the end of the interview here, I want to move a little bit into the, uh, the, the, the personal side of John. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask you some weird questions, just kind of, uh, Please, roll with on. It. All right. So the first one, I'll start off with some easy ones. First one is uh, in 2012, you traveled to the world's best celebrations. You ran with the Bulls yep. in Pamplona. You did Burning Man. Um, what do you think collectively you got from all of those experiences around the world? Like if you had to encapsulate it, what did you learn? Um, that a an event in itself uh, gives the potential of incredible bonding. So if we're running of the bulls together, we might not speak. We might not like know each other. We might literally be from different cultures that can't communicate. But because we go through the same experience together, I can give you a head nod and you give me that head nod back and there's something there. And so it's, uh, I think, celebrations are critical for cultural bonding. And uh, I don't think we use them well enough to actually bring people together, especially considering how lonely people are these days. That's great. Um, tell me about the, uh, the wedding crash your business and twerking with bride's parents. What, 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 oh, how, oh did, my God. how did this there happen? Was so many, like I did this a few times. Uh, I totally forgot that I did this. The movie Wedding Crashers came out and it, I thought it would be like a really great idea uh, to do it. And I, I, in fact, was, got so into it that I used to travel with a tuxedo in case there was like an opportunity to, to, uh, like just attend an event or you know, go to some crazy party. And on a few occasions, like I put on a tux, went to Cannes Film Festival, and then just like walked into parties as if I had just come from the award show. Because why else would somebody be in a tux? 
And like so, they but, just wouldn't stop you. Okay, so you so you crash the wedding, but but not only yeah. crashing the wedding, you're like twerking with the the bride's parents. Like, how did this happen? Yes, I'm like dancing with them. I'm like doing shots with people. I'm having drinks. Like I'm yeah. It's I have this photo of me with grandma at the wedding. And she's like, oh, it's so good to meet you. Are you friends of like, you know, whatever it is, my granddaughter. And like, I have this selfie with her that I like, I'll never forget this, this, uh, this image. And then I met grandpa and like, they're exactly what you'd kind of expect, like very elderly sitting on the side and we're just chatting. It was so surreal because I really didn't belong there. Didn't know anybody. Uh, and I coincidentally, this was so weird at the time I was, uh, a before and after fitness model for a late night video infomercial called Rev Abs. It was when the, like the P90X had come out. This was like the follow-up program from Beach Bodies. Yeah. And uh, so I was in training with it. Then I wasn't even drinking. I, I don't think at this uh, wedding that I crashed. And the photographer and the singer on stage were coincidentally in the training program with me. So he started putting me uh, in photos and like trying to introduce me oh to the, this is completely coincidental to like the bridesmaids. And then, uh, like, you know, she was on stage singing and winking at me and like, it was just completely surreal. It was something out of a movie. I couldn't have planned it at all. Uh, this is amazing. So much fun. In, uh, in 2014, New York city said you were, uh, you were the most successful bachelor. What did that feel like? <laughs> Uh, it, clearly they didn't have access to my bank accounts. Because otherwise, <laughs> There's this funny impression that when you're at the center of a community uh, with impressive people, yeah. that you must be wildly, wildly wealthy or something. I remember one of my friends getting a phone call saying, hey, can you introduce me to that billionaire friend of yours? And I was, uh, and she told this to me and both of us just started cracking up. She was staying at my house. She was a house guest at the time. And because both of us were like barely making ends meet to cover uh, the dinners slash all of my expenses. And it's just so funny, the difference between impression and reality. Uh, what do people often get wrong about the kind of work that you do? Oh, interesting. I, I think that uh, I think that people don't understand that that I kind of live by behavioral science research. And the research really shows that after a certain amount of income, and I make a fine income, I'm just not a billionaire or anything like that, uh, more money doesn't make the difference. What does is human connection and belonging and bringing people together. And so I spent a disproportionate amount of my time intentionally not monetizing things. Mm. Like, and that's because if it was about monetization, Worse, I would the, the joy. The moment you monetize it, you shift it so that you could sell the product. I get it. Um, all right. So we're going to do a speed round now as we wrap up. Just give me, uh, you can answer as quickly as you like. First thing that pops into your mind, what would your friend say is one of your superpowers? Oh, introducing people. Super easy. Like I, you say three things and then immediately my mind goes to the list of people that you should be best friends with. And I'm pretty solid at like, you know how you said like the blink stuff, that's like where my blink stuff comes in. It's not knowing what you do professionally. It's like, this is who you should be friends with. Do you collect anything or have you ever collected anything? Oh, I used to collect comic books as a kid. I've like, I think over a thousand comic books in the house. Whoa. Uh, yeah. I mean, like I have a pretty decent collection, early X-Men, Avengers, that kind of stuff. What do people I inherited some of it from my brothers, but I kept it going. What do people never ask you, but you wish they did? Hmm. Wow. That's tough. Um, if you were to say, John, given these, these are my resources, how can I create the biggest impact for other people? That is really good. What's your guilty pleasure? Cheesecake. <laughs> yeah. I, if I could eat cheesecake all the time, I definitely, uh, and not gain weight, that would be like, oh my God, that would be the best. If you had to give a TED talk on nothing that you're known for, nothing that you speak about, but it could be on anything that you want, mm -hmm. anything that you have a passion for, 
what would it be? Uh, how games uh, will save the world. Like, I, I think that we, and, and you actually are a perfect example of this. People work really hard. Uh, I think that we need to actually play with ease. So play is this give and take that occurs that doesn't have a purpose. And it has this intrinsic joy that you can get lost in it. And I play like I'll maybe, you know, go work out. I, but I throw myself into it so hard that like I'm wrecked after, right? But it's like a bit of a playtime for me. You play some basketball or something like that, right? But I, I think that we need to rediscover play. Uh, yeah. I think that we, especially with all the burnout going on. Love that. You preach it to the choir here. Last, uh, last question. What one question would you like to ask me? We'll change it up a little bit. Oh, um, okay. You've planned this incredible experience for all of your guests. And everything seems that it's something that's being done to them, right? And they're being served prosciutto and cheeses and it's tastings and dinners. What is it that we could look at that would have them do for one another so that they feel invested in the relationships? Human beings bond over this Ikea effect, right? This investment of effort. If we want to ease their bonding and make it go faster, then we need to give them a problem that's big enough that no one person can solve it on them, their own. It's a great and then question. Putting them through it. Yeah, it's a great question. And I, I, I sadly don't have a great answer for you, but I, but I can tell you that I am starting to think about that. Um, and what I am doing for the first time ever is Massimo Batura has a, a charity, but it's not just a give me money charity. It's a different kind of charity. What he does is in Milan, he um, created a restaurant for homeless people. And mm -hmm. it is done not as upscale as Francesca, uh, Osteria Francescana, you know, his, his uh, Michelin, highest rated Michelin star restaurant in the world, but it's, it's pretty nice. And mm -hmm. he decided that he wanted to create a dignified environment for the people that were homeless to be able to connect and share a meal with each other and not feel like they're in a soup kitchen and do it in a way yeah. that they're proud. So we are arriving one day early um, mm -hmm. before the event starts. And we're all going before we begin all the fancy Ferraris to go into that. And as a group, be a part of serving and be a part of that experience. Um, I love it. I think that's fantastic. It's a, it's I think a that, start. It's, it's a start. Yeah. I think that this is a, a perfect example that, you know, I, I get invited on these kind of crazy trips by very impressive people. And it's generous and loving and done with such care. And what I see is that people bond because of the wrapping around the experience and because you know, naturally people are inquisitive, they talk to each other, they, they do their thing. But something as simple as playing on teams a game, so it's this group versus that group, causes that IKEA effect to, to kick in and potentially higher levels of vulnerability because you have to work together as a team. And in those moments, the bonding accelerates dramatically. And I love that you're, you're doing this. I think it's fantastic. Thanks, man. We did, uh, I, I, there's one more we did. It's, it's a light version, but it, but it made me think of it. When we were in, uh, in Mexico, we did a sandcastle contest. We jumped out of a boat yes. and we, we went this, you go on that side of the beach, you go on that side of the beach. That is you, so good. You make the yeah, sandcastles. And then we had um, somebody, an independent person vote who had the best sandcastle. And then we, you know, we shit talked each other while we did it, but it was, yeah, uh, and it was, but it was fun. and it really doesn't matter who wins or, or not. It allows for like creative expression yeah. and it allows for shared bonding experience where the stakes aren't critical. It's play. Right. And I think that that's fantastic. The more of that kind of stuff that you do and maybe even switch people up in the, which teams they're at so they can meet different people. 
I think that's fantastic. Great. John, you are, uh, you're, you're one of those people that you, you wear your heart on your sleeve and your, um, your intention of what you're putting out into this world is palpable. And uh, I know we just met each other, but um, if I might say, I am really proud of you and I'm really proud of the work that you're doing Thank you. because I think it's, Thank I think it's much. a beautiful thing that you're putting out into the world and it is having uh, a ripple effect. And like my, uh, my spirit guides are, t- are telling me right now that, uh, that you are doing exactly what your purpose is. So keep fucking doing it. Uh, that's, uh, this is, that's, Really, really wonderful to hear. And thank you very much. And uh, I also want to thank you. This has been a super fun interview. I, I do a lot of podcasts and uh, and this was not that. Like this was not the standard turnkey thing. This was super interesting and engaging. And I, I really appreciate it. Thanks, uh, brother. Thanks, brother. We'll link everything up in the show notes so they can uh, reach out uh, and connect and uh, get your book and all that stuff. That sounds great. Thank you. Thank you.